I looked at every single Pokemon Shiny and Normal Sprites from Generations 1 to 5 to find out if Shiny Sprites are actually made by an algorithm as many online theorize, or if they're all actually hand designed, including the ones that barely change. So let's find out. Naturally, we have to start at when Shinies were first created. No, not in Generation 2, but Generation 1. In 2018, the 1997 beta for Generation 2 was leaked online. Cut Pokemon that never made it in were for once out in the public eye, and interestingly enough, every Pokemon had a Shiny despite only being a demo. But the reason why I still classify this as Generation 1 is because they built this demo from the original Pokemon Blue version on the same console the Super Game Boy. Because of the low range of colors on that system's palette, Pokemon would primarily have one main color, so many Pokemon shared the exact same colors. This meant that their shinies, as leaked in the Gen 2 beta, would also change to the same colors. Green turned to a less saturated yellow, oranges to dark reds, pinks to light blues, and the list goes on. Even the new unreleased Pokemon introduced all follow the exact same rules. So if shinies were in the original games, this is what they would have looked like. Why is this important? Well, it shows that Game Freak looked to create patterns in shiny Pokemon even this early on. They could have made some shinies take others non-shiny colors, but instead they made them all change in the same way, which could suggest that shinies do have some predetermined pattern. Some Pokemon even kept the same base and shiny color patterns from the beta to the official Gen 2 games, but with just more detailed and updated color scheme for the Game Boy Color. And for some reason, Raichu's shiny from the beta became its base color in gold and silver. But regardless, for the majority of Pokemon, this wasn't the case. Since the Game Boy Color could display more colors, most sprites got a complete color overhaul, and every Pokemon sprite was now comprised of two main colors not including white and black for shadowing. This opened the floodgates as now many of the Pokemon with the same normal colors don't turn the same shiny. Heck, even sometimes in the same evolution line. So, how does the algorithm theory explain this? Well, let's start with Lockstein's video on shinies from Gen 2. He used color harmony rules from the color wheel in Photoshop, which is a tool used to generate different color palettes depending on the rules applied. These rules can vary from triad colors, which are colors always at the ends of a triangle-like shape on the color wheel, complementary colors, which are colors on the opposite ends of the wheel, and compound, which is like a greater and less than symbol. But do these rules actually explain shiny patterns? In some cases, yes. There are still outliers that are unexplainable and we'll get to those later, but as Lockstein pointed out, many blue Pokemon turn purple and vice versa, which is a triad rule. Now keep in mind the more darker blue you go on the wheel, the less pink and purple actually become its triad, but you have to give some margin of error here, since there are enough examples of it happening to suggest at least a basic principle being applied. Here are some other triad rules that apply. Pinkish reds turn yellow, brown, which is basically orange with low saturation, turns green, yellows to pinks and purples, reds turning a mustardy gold even when the saturation is turned way down like on Ampharos' body. Of the complementary rules, purples sometimes turn green, inverted colors, which isn't a color harmony rule on the Photoshop wheel, but nevertheless happens often like blues turning red and vice versa, even on secondary colors. And, in rare cases, the main color's triad or complementary color is applied to its secondary color with near-perfect results. It's kind of freaky how close this specific method got even when I applied it to other difficult Pokemon in future gens, just with saturation differences. Veselia's purple body is nearly the exact same shade as its secondary color's yellow triad. But shinies don't only change using these color harmony rules. Lockstein also found type patterns that occasionally apply to a big group of Pokemon like all Gen 1 fighting types turning green regardless of the color, or blue Pokemon turning to their aqua colors, which is kind of similar to what happened to the blue shinies in the beta, and so on. But then how does the algorithm theory explain Pokemon like the Abra line or Squirtle's evolutions where they are very close if not identical base colors but don't have the same shiny? Well, you have to remember that a shiny doesn't always change completely from its original colors. Many have their original colors as hue, saturation, and or brightness adjusted which I'll be referring to as HSB for the rest of the video. These HSB changes sometimes follow their own strange patterns. Like Gligar losing saturation in its main color, the same amount the secondary color gained saturation in. 
Magby, Smoochum, and Ellie Kid all get a hue and saturation increase like their one group of Pokemon. Fanfi just becomes less saturated, etc. Hence, if this algorithm works off of a flowchart like Lockstein suggested, some Pokemon who already had their colors changed may have another chance at being selected for one of these HSB edits. Which is why Abra and Kudabra stay the same, but Alakazam's saturation is slightly turned down, as well as many other examples like it. Now, this doesn't explain every Pokemon change as I'm showing you on screen, and remember that these colors are rarely exactly their color harmony rule counterparts. Generalization was done as it's unrealistic to expect perfect results. And remember that the theory doesn't rule out developer intervention completely, as it's undeniably happened a couple of times. But then I found out that we both got something very wrong. I and Lockstein for his video are using the sprites from Pokemon Crystal, but some Pokemon colors in the original gold and silver had different normal colors, but the exact same shiny. How did this affect the algorithm theories methods we used above? Well, most Pokemon stay the exact same color, but for the ones that do change, sometimes it actually complemented the algorithm theory more. Blue Wabafet was actually a lighter cyan, which is a more closer triad to its shiny. Same story with Espeon's original darker purple to green and Umbreon's darker yellow to blue. Some Pokemon get their shiny explanations changed, like Pupitar's darker blue is now explained by a hue change rather than a triad change, which wasn't that close to begin with either way. Skarmory completely becomes its blue equivalent's triad, which explains why even in Crystal, its secondary normal color was red, but it just went to green anyways. While Aerodactyl's shiny was explained by an unsaturated yellow to purple triad, but is actually its main pink saturation turned up and its orange wings turning its complementary color blue. Unknown does the opposite. It was a saturation increase, but now it's just a green to blue hue shift. Blossom's main green is lighter and its secondary color used to be pink, so maybe a slight hue change or it applied its main green colors triad because once again, it's scary close, just with different saturation levels. But there are a few weird ones in here. Sneasel's pink feather turning its triad yellow was actually actually on the same scale, but turquoise cyan to yellow instead. But its main colors are a bit hard to explain. The only pan I could justify it with is if you apply its secondary cyan colors triad to the main for a pink, but that's a bit of a stretch. Croconaw and Feraligator were different hues of pistachio. Crazy enough, Feraligator's primary color was originally the same as its shiny, but with an inverted second color. This was later changed in Crystal. There's still a few more examples of normal colors changing, and they barely made any changes to the shinies, but even when they did, it was usually just minor HSV edits. Either way, this showed a few things to keep in mind when using Lockstein's methods. There's seven different color harmony rules that we can apply to try explaining random color patterns, plus HSB. So when do we draw the line that a color isn't a pan? Like applying Sneasel's secondary colors triad to its main color just because the main color doesn't have any correlation to its shiny change. Or using compound colors as many possibilities to explain certain hue changes. Although these methods work occasionally, there are sometimes other ways to get the same result as shown by what I showed you with the gold and silver sprites versus Lockstein's explanations of their later crystal sprites. That's why going forward onto other gens, if I see a pan reoccurring, even if it's not exactly on point to its color harmony rule, as long as it's a visible pattern that reoccurs multiple times, I'll count it valid because we don't know when exactly in the development process shinies were made. Heck, Gen 2's beta Pokemon had them. And we don't know what original shade of color each Pokemon had when its respective shinies were made because back in generations 1, 2, and possibly even 3, the sprites were made before the official art, which is why all the shinies basically stay the same while their normal sprites were later changed. But there's one big detail that I couldn't look past with the algorithm theory. Just how random some of these shiny colors are. Like, why does the Bulbasaur line's primary color all turn a lighter green? Bulbasaur's secondary red stays the same, but its evolutions both get a red to yellow triad shift. Why does Ponita's flame get unsaturated while Rapidash's becomes purple? 
Squirtle and Wartortle use the same shade of blue for their non-shiny sprites, but the whole line progressively gets less saturated for its shiny. And how does the Charizard line go from yellow to orange to purple? I get we said every Pokemon may undergo a random chance at a HSB change in the algorithm, but some of these examples are just too specific to just look over. And then you get strange mistakes like Gloom and Vileplume's flower color turning red to orangey yellow, which is like Ivy and Venusaur's change. But Odish's green leaf does the same, even when having no color connection like its evolutions did. If this was an algorithm, it would have turned its leaf into something like Bulbasaur or Weeping Bell's green instead of just following its Evo secondary color change pattern. And we know this is a mistake and not it turning the grass type autumn color rule because they fixed this in the next gen games. So I had to look deeper into this and what I found almost changed everything. A reddit user by the name of Stormycon posted about why he thinks all shinies are handmade. Initially I was like, there's no way. Not after I've already looked at 600 plus Pokemon looking for patterns to prove an algorithm. But he talked about a feature in Gen 2 that barely anyone knows about. The debug menu. Usually a debug menu is a test mode for developers to try out certain things in the game's engine. Now you can only use ROMs and hacks to access this mode, but this is an official part of the game, just hidden from the players. And all the footage of it isn't mine, so huge shout out to Professor Rex and Eevee for letting me use their debug room footage, give them a sub and the links to their original videos in the description. In the debug menu, you can create Pokemon with any stats and moves, give yourself any item, verse any trainer, and even change the colors of the overworld, trainers, and Pokemon. That's right, and each Pokemon in this mode has both their normal sprites and their rare sprites, along with the settings used to create them. This menu shows three color sliders, red, blue, and green, and changing the values obviously yields different results. And you can change both the primary and secondary colors of every Pokemon. So does this completely disprove the use of an algorithm? Well, not entirely. Though I do think for Gen 2, because it is only two colors per Pokemon, it's not unreasonable to think that someone could have went in and changed these sliders by hand. I mean, even the normal sprites change from gold and silver to crystal, so I don't see any reason why they couldn't use this method to create shinies as well. Plus, this basically explains all the small differences with color changing in evolution lines I explained earlier. The Squirtle line follow a similar shiny change but are manually edited to be slightly different shades of blue and green for Blastoise. Bulbasaur keeping the same red was most likely a deliberate dev choice, and this even explains anomalies like why Nidoqueen is the only one that doesn't follow the gender swap color change pattern. Nidoran and Nidorina have their primary colors, which is always the color on the left side as pink. Now usually this is the color that covers the majority of the Pokemon, hence why Nidoran and Nidorina's body are pink and their secondary color as green. Surprisingly, Nidoqueen does follow the same pattern, but for whatever reason its primary colors on its sprite is where the secondary color should be. Either by a mistake when assigning Nidoqueen's color order on this menu and when pasting its evolution line's color change rules as a group, or it's a conscious choice to make at least one Pokemon in the evolution line slightly different like I assume what happened to many others we discussed before. And again, a big thank you to Eevee for sending me these picks as I wouldn't have been able to confirm the Nidoqueen line's color positions without them or basically everything else in this segment of the video, so huge thank you, it made the world different. But this doesn't mean that the pans we found are completely false either. Just like the beta sprite shinies, clearly the developers like creating some patterns for colors to follow as it makes it easier for them to create the shinies in general. So they could have made some of these rules as a guideline to follow when creating the shiny, or it just so happened that these patterns were the easiest colors to create on the sliders while still looking decent, so they just followed a similar pattern for Pokemon with the same type, colors, or whatever else. And it's not impossible that they could have made a base code to automatically create and apply these patterns, followed by developer touch-ups through the color sliders, since there are so many slight color differences. Though, I do think that for Gen 2 it was done by hand as every change to color is identified in the sliders as well as the general randomness of some shinies, while some evolution lines kind of being grouped in together as one color change with just slight HSB differences to make them not exactly the same. So it definitely feels like it was done manually. So the possibility of shinies being created completely by developers is just as high as them using an algorithm. And I want to clear up something Lockstein said. He suggested that an algorithm wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between Diglett and the Dirt, hence why the algorithm would have changed both their colors to blue. 
but each Pokemon is only allowed two colors. And since they made the Glitz Nose the same color as the Dirt, it had to change together. And which is why I assume they changed Golbat's wings to blue in crystal, even though it was more accurate to its official art in gold and silver. Because they couldn't just change the purple leaking on Golbat's face, because it shared the same color as its wings, so they had to change its secondary color to blue to make it look neater. But things aren't so simple moving into Gen 3, since now every Pokemon has around 15 colors each. and it only gets more complicated in Gens 4 and 5. So would they really go in and change every color by hand, or is it easier to implement an algorithm? Subscribe so you don't miss our second part where we analyze every shiny change from Gens 3 to 5.